history. So hopefully everyone can um, see my PowerPoint slide. So we're here, we're gonna talk about web ready maps from a beginner's perspective. So how my journey all started um, is with COVID-19. Uh, back when I was working as a data analyst at Massachusetts General Hospital, my team and I sort of put all our research projects on hold to lend a hand um, to help policymakers uh, make better decisions with regards to COVID-19. So one of the ways in which uh, we thought we would be helpful as a data science group was to build maps to look at trends and dynamics of COVID-19 spread. Um, so given that mapping was gonna be an instrumental part of that, um, very quickly became overwhelming just Googling and researching the different ways in which to make a map. Um, so this GIF really aptly describes how, what I was going through really. Um, there was lots and lots of new words and, and jargon and, and packages and, and, and so forth, which speaks to the you know, complexity of, of the task. Um, but I think what really helped here was just try to uh, narrow down the problem as much as I could. Uh, meaning first thinking about the considerations that we had. Um, one of the ones was that we needed to make something that was fast. We knew that we wanted this tool to be available uh, on the internet, uh, broadly accessible to people with all sorts of internet connection and, and devices. The second consideration was that we needed it to be interactive. So that narrowed down a little bit the uh, tools in the spatial ecosystem that we were going to uh, look into. Um, something that didn't involve us learning a new language, just given the, the time constraint and what our team was familiar with. We knew that we wanted to find um, ideally an R, R Studio workflow. So that also uh, significantly narrowed down uh, the tools that we were going to be using. And we, of course, wanted it to be done from our console or our studio, at least the majority of it, if not the entire process. And then um, we wanted it to be mostly free, but look professional. And uh, that is a consideration mostly because we wanted our tool um, and our findings to be taken seriously and presentation and communication, of course, goes, goes a long way. So we were very happy to find out that our um, has a really powerful and rich ecosystem for spatial analysis and spatial visualizations. And that comes from R being inherently very flexible and can play nicely with GIS, geo libraries, and their functions. And on the right side, we can see a plot of the downloads of the different R packages that exist. And we can certainly see an explosion in the use of many of them over time, which speaks to um, just how sophisticated these packages have become for spatial analysis. And I'll draw your attention to the first two, uh, which are SF and SB, which have outpaced all the other ones, and those will be the stars of this presentation. So happy to report that a few weeks later, as a complete beginner who has really never done any mapping or knew any of the jargon or the words, uh, we were able to deploy 
um, a shiny app containing a leaflet map, an interactive one, uh, which was fast and um, interactive. So I'll be talking about the, the processes that I've gone through and the packages that I've found success with. And hopefully that will be um, inspiration to you all as you're digging into this. So what we'll be covering specifically are four beginner friendly workflows via the following packages, map view, tmap, leaflet, and R2D3 map. And I have an RMD and R markdown that I'll be sharing um, at the end of this presentation. All right, so let's, I'm gonna switch gears and go to the R markdown. Um, and as I'm doing that, if there's any questions, uh, please feel free to unmute yourself um, and ask away. I know also um, there'll, there'll be some moderation too, so please feel free to cut me off at any point. Okay, so um, as I've teased in not too long ago, there's, there's a lot of jargon and, and some fundamentals that I think um, are worth mentioning and getting acquainted with because they'll come up a lot in your uh, readings and your exploration. So uh, the first thing we need to wrap our heads around is the concept of a geometry. And everything is basically defined according according to these three core geometries, which you can then combine to make more complex ge geometries. And that's really what defines a physical space, either a nation or state or a set of islands and so forth. So those three core geometries are polygons, points, and lines. These geometries, essentially the shapes of physical spaces, can be imported and manipulated in R with many packages, with the most popular being Tigris for tiger line and shape files. This one is very popular for US geometries. And then SF, which we've seen in the slides um, as the one exploding in popularity. SF package stands for simple feature objects. Um, so in this presentation, we'll be using the words geometries and simple features interchangeably. Um, and the best way to just, um, you know, remember those is just they make up the uh, shape and the shape of the physical space we're talking about. So let's dig into those packages a little bit, uh, starting with the Tigris package. So the Tigris package um, has commands such as states or counties, depending on the shapes that you want to work with. And these are imported in the back end from the US Census Bureau website. Then what these command do after importing that is storing this data in a user cache directory or a temporary directory, and then it loads them into your R session. What you can then do with these geometries is you can merge them to other data sets that may contain information of interest with GeoJoin. So we can think of GeoJoin as a left join, but when we're working with spatial objects, we need to use um, a special command like GeoJoin to preserve the nature of that data frame as a spatial object. That's going to be really important as we're um, working through the workflows. Yasma? Yeah, go ahead. Um, are you able to zoom in just like kind of a, yes. yeah. Perfect, sweet, thank you. Awesome, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, we are right here, just wrapping up our discussion on um, how we need to use GeoJoin instead of LeftJoin to merge and join our data sets to preserve the state um, of our spatial data frame. And so this, this is starting to piece it together. This is the common workflow in spatial analysis and visualizations where we first need to import our shape files. Um, shape file constitutes what you could call the entire data set containing your simple features or your geometries. 
So you import those, then you may want to merge them or join them to other data sets containing um, information um, that you're interested in visualizing. Then you may need to do some additional manipulations on those geometries um, with the SF package. And then finally, uh, once the data set has been assembled to your liking, you can then visualize them with a really rich ecosystem of packages um, like ggplot2, mapview, tmap, leaflet, r2d3 maps, and we'll be looking into um, the four last ones listed on that list. And so we've talked about, you know, merging and joining data sets via GeoJoin, which is a left join, but for spatial objects. Um, similarly, if you need to combine or bind objects together, there's a helpful function called rbind underscore tigris to bind two data sets together. Okay, so that's that's our introduction to the Tigris package, which is used to import, store, and load our geometries. The next package that we've teased so far is the SF package. Um, so SF, as we've talked about, stands for simple features. And the really powerful thing about this package and why it's exploded in popularity over the others is because we can now treat these spatial objects as regular data frames. So that makes for really powerful capabilities when it comes to both the reading and the writing of that data, which happens relatively fast. Um, there's enhanced plotting performance and they can, because they can be used as regular data frames, uh, we can use tidyverse workflows with the piping operator to do additional manipulations. And the SF package has been really elegantly designed in which, you know, if we invest the time up front to get acquainted with the commands, um, hopefully you'll see that the function names are relatively consistent and intuitive. Um, they all start with ST underscore. And um, by investing that time up front, in, in learning them, then you can reuse them really for probably 99% of your spatial workflows. So due to these advantages, um, the SF package is supported in many popular packages like TMAP, which we'll see, which you can think of as ggplot2, but for maps. And tidy census, a really popular package for obtaining US census data. So as we've seen, the SF package is, is now the most popular package for spatial manipulations. However, the SP package, which is its predecessor, is also still pretty popular. Um, it also generates objects of class spatial. And there's some packages out there that you may see that have support for SP, but not SF. So it's good to be mindful and check the documentation if you're getting some errors or something's not looking right. Um, thankfully, they've they've made this pretty easy in case you are dealing with a package that only has support for the SP one. You can switch um, the class of your object pretty easily with just one command. Okay, so that was our introduction to the two main packages used for importing shape files and manipulating them. We're going to start getting into uh, some of the workflows. Uh, before we do that, we're going to load all the packages needed today. Um, this looks like an, oh, a pretty long list for, for a project. Um, but given that we are going through four workflows, that's that's why. Hopefully we'll see some familiar ones here. Tidyverse uh, for cleaning and wrangling. Uh, janitor, big fan of that for cleaning column names and frequency tables. Tidy census, which we'll use to import some census data that we're interested in mapping. The SF package, the Tigris package, Albers USA, which has some uh, interesting shapefiles we'll look into, TMAP, 
map view, R2D3 maps. Those are some packages that we'll explore for mapping. Shiny, because we'll go through um, an examples just showing how easy it is to embed these maps in, in Shiny. Shiny SSS loaders, which is just a loading icon for when our map gets rendered, because sometimes it can take a little bit of time. Leaflet, our fourth star package for mapping, our color brewer for color palettes and HTML tools, uh, which we'll see in action through Leaflet. Uh, so our first consideration after loading our packages is to obtain our shape files. So as we've seen, Tigris helps us do that. And with just one call uh, to the function that we're interested in, in this case, we're interested in counties, uh, we can specify some additional arguments inside counties to uh, specify the resolution of those geometries. So that's an important consideration uh, for the reactivity and the speed in which your maps load. So basically you can get as precise as possible with let's say your county borders, um, but sometimes that's not really needed. Uh, you can kind of smooth through those county borders and that makes a really big difference in how fast your map renders. So in this case, we've picked one of the lower resolutions because we're not quite interested in really, really precise borders for our counties. And then we're just doing some cleaning. Um, when you import these, you'll see that the FIPS code, so that's kind of, you can think of that as a identifier for a numerical identifier for a county. We're just renaming that to, to FIPS. One thing that I always like to do and is good practice is just inspecting the class of the object you've just imported just to sanity check it. In this case, we can see from the printout that it's of class SF data frame, which is exactly what we want. Um, given that we've imported a spatial object, we definitely do want it to be of class SF. And so that's kind of step number one in our workflow is just to get our geometries. Uh, then we've seen that, you know, once we have those geometries, there may be information about those counties that we want. So we may want to bring in an external data set and then join it to our geometries. So in this case, we'll be using the tidy census package to import median household income data from the 2015 to 2019 American Community Survey. We'll specify the geography as being county, given we're interested um, in these incomes by county, and then the variable um, that's, that corresponds to the median household income in the US Census Bureau data. We'll do some cleaning and we'll drop um, those rows in which the values are null. Okay, so that's our, our second step is just to import uh, the data set of interest and make sure it has the same uh, sort of level as our shape file. So given that it's county, we gotta make sure that our external data set is also by county. Then our third step is then to put those together. So we can do so with GeoJoin. Um, so I'm taking my county shapefile and joining it to the US county income uh, file and then specifying the column by which the join should be performed, which in this case is the numerical identifier of the county, um, which is FIPS. So I've called it the same um, county. So we can inspect the class again. Um, and as expected, it's of class SF, which is uh, what we want. We still want a spatial data frame. And you can inspect this object in R2. Uh, you'll see that it contains um, a column called geometry, 
which is a very long string of uh, text and numbers specifying exactly what those borders are like. And then you'll also see that um, US county income data all joined together. And then from there, you can do any sort of manipulations if needed with the SF package. Um, in this case, we don't have any manipulations to be done, so we can go ahead and start visualizing. Any questions? So far, so good. Awesome. Okay, so workflow number one is we'll be using the map view package and the map view package. Um, according to Kyle Walker, who's the developer of Tidy Census and, and other packages, was really a game changer. Um, many people did not want to transition from ArcGIS or, or other GIS softwares, um, given that our workflows were a bit more involved. Uh, but MapView uh, changed the game basically by being able to visualize your shapes and your data with just essentially one line. <laughs> so that's what we've done here. We've initialized our map with map view and then fed it our county object. And then here we are, we can sanity check um, that we've indeed ended up with county geometries. So that's pretty cool. That, that really made a difference in people's adoption of R-based workflows for mapping. And the great thing about this too is, you know, if you hover over, you have some attributes relating to the county. I believe these numbers just refer to um, the row indices. So not that informative, um, but definitely could customize it. And then what's cool also is you can preview what your map would look like if you used other base maps. So base maps is that underlying layer. So you can think of that as anything under these shapes we've overlaid. So you can look at what your map would look like with dark matter, <laughs> not advisable here, obviously. Uh, open street map, which has more information about uh, the state and the cities. And, and so on. You can also deselect county just to see what that base map looks like in its naked form. Okay, so with you know with one line we could you know sanity check our shapes. Um, obviously, this is not very informative. Um, we're going to specify an argument called Z col, which specifies okay. Uh, we have these county geometries. What do we want to do with them? Well, in this case, we want to color them by income. So that's what's happening here is it generated an interactive chloral plus of median household incomes. And we can see that, you know, by, by feeding it our object and this Z coal specification of the column of interest, we have a pretty attractive looking map of our counties. Um, this time the pop up shows the actual median income, um, but we can see that this map is definitely not web ready <laughs> in any way. Uh, you definitely do want some labels in there. You may want to change your legend to be um, more informative, given that the numbers are a little squished in here. Uh, but there's a lot to be um, discovered in map view in terms of customization. And uh, please do check out the documentation uh, for it. This is a really attractive option for very quick sanity checking and mapping um, for yourself or internally in, in, in meetings. The second workflow that I that I've grown to like is with tmap. Um, so that's another popular package for static and interactive mapping. And much like with map view, it's pretty easy to get up and running with just a few commands. Um, in this case, we just have one extra one in which we need to tell tmap that 
we want it to be interactive. So that's this is the way to initialize that interactivity or else it's going to be static. And then um, we once again initialize the, the, the map by feeding it the object and then using TM fill to specify um, the column that we want visualized. In this case, it's still income. Uh, we can specify a palette, an alpha, which is uh, op opacity or transparency, and then um, a title. So we can see that it looks a little cleaner here. The legend is, is taken care of um, quite elegantly. It's been bucketed for us already. Um, you can certainly change that if you'd like. Um, same as with map view, you can very quickly toggle through different face maps. Um, zoom functionality is also in there. But we can see that TMAP handled our, our county borders a little differently. Um, so that would either, um, that, that might trigger you to go back to your data and maybe select a, another resolution for your borders to make them look a little more attractive. Um, um, but that there, there will be a trade-off, of course, with how uh, quickly your maps render if you do increase the resolution on those. Uh, but TMAP is still a very attractive solution, especially um, zoomed in. Let's say you're only interested in Maryland. Um, we can see that those borders look a little, a little cleaner. I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so, so what you're saying is that those those white lines as you zoom up are like a function of the resolution. And if you kind of like did your highest resolution option, then are those white lines where like the geometries just aren't fitting together perfectly? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Chris. Great, so we're getting into my favorite workflow, which is Leaflet. Um, and I'm gonna spend a little time just talking about what Leaflet is. So Leaflet is a very popular open source JavaScript library for um, just interactive mapping. And it's, it's so popular that many websites that we use um, make use of it, like the New York Times, the Washington Post, GIS software, and others. So, so that speaks to just how powerful its capabilities and ease of use are. And thankfully, the leaflet R package wraps around that and gives us many of those powerful um, functionalities. So as with MapView, and TMAP, we have interactive panning and zooming. Um, with Leaflet, we have the possibility of layering many combinations of objects. So, so far we've seen just one type of object, which is essentially just, you can think of these as, as tiles, um, but with Leaflet, you can imagine putting pins on things or just adding um, more information into your maps and leaflet makes that uh, quite um, relatively straightforward. Uh, with the leaflet R package, you never have to leave R and R Studio. Um, so that's not a, a new advantage because with MapView and TMap, we saw that we can you know, stay in R and R Studio for the entire time. Um, but given that it's a JavaScript library, that's, that's pretty cool that, that we can have um, our workflow be entirely in R. Uh, you can easily insert leaflet maps in R Markdown, Shiny, and, and more. Um, it plays very nicely with SB or SF packages or any packages that you may use for spatial manipulation. You can toggle between different projections. So we haven't really touched on that so far, but um, a simple way to put this is um, essentially maps are a model of, of how we think the world looks um, once we sort of flatten it in two dimensions. And there may be different projections that you, that you may wanna use to represent um, nations 
or, or any spatial object. So that's what that refers to. And then you can make use of um, a wide array of leaflet plugins to do some pretty cool stuff um, and add some additional functionalities to your maps. The implementation with leaflet is uh, straightforward and pipeable, which is nice. So we can kind of deconstruct our different components and, and use them in isolation and, and iteratively. So as with other packages, the first step is to initialize that map. So we'll make a call to leaflet and feed it our spatial data set. Then we're gonna make use of add provider tiles. So that helps you add a base map uh, to, to your map, depending on which one you like. We saw with, with map view and tmap, there's many base maps that, that we can use. Add polygons, so that adds the geometries and any additional arguments that you want. So what that really means is just you can customize how those shapes look like. Let's say you wanted the borders to be white, red, or black. Um, you can feed all of that customizability inside add polygons. And then we can add a legend to uh, the map. Um, so just a couple steps before you know, we really initialize our map. We just may want to specify the color palette to use. So in this case, we'll be using the yellow, orange, red palette from the R color brewer package. And then we'll specify the um, variable with which we want the coloring to be done on, which is income. And we're gonna say it's nu numeric. So we'll wrap it inside this color numeric uh, command. And we'll save that as pal, which stands for palette. Then we're going to specify what we want our labels to be, um, to say for the most part. So this is where the HTML tools package comes in play. And you may see some um, characters here that may look a little weird. Um, that's because we're using a bit of CSS, I believe, to just customize the appearance of those labels. Um, basically using BR to skip a line um, and then specifying the variables here that we want used. In this case, we're gonna use the name column inside our data set and the income column. So basically this labels has a set of instructions for how our um, hover, uh, when we hover over a county, how the information is displayed. Okay, so once we've specified those um, outside of our, of our leaflet initialization, um, we can go ahead and initialize it. So with a, with a call to leaflet, and then we're gonna set the view. And these are longitude and latitudes um, that allow us to right away uh, zoom into the United States because that's the area we'll be interested in. Obviously, if you were interested in, let's say, Kenya, you would have to look up the longitude and latitudes approximately of that country and feed them in here. And then the last argument here refers to how much zoomed in do we want? And in this case, a specified for. The second step here is to add the provider tile. So that's adding the base map. In this case, we'll use Cardo DB Positron. We'll see what that looks like in a bit. And then thirdly, we add the polygons. So um, there's a bunch of stuff in here, mostly for customizing uh, what those polygons should look like. But the important one to note here is that we are saying the fill color should be um, the income as we've specified above. And here um, we fed it the labels um, that we've made right before this map. And then some additional arguments about um, the size and, and the font and what that should look like. 
And then the last step is to add a legend. Um, and in here, you see a bunch of arguments relating to uh, customizing the legend. And voila, this is what our map roughly looks like. Um, still a bit of work to do here. Um, the thing that stands out is this is not very attractive having the city names and the state names be under our, pol our colored polygons. Um, so there's a bit of trickery we can use to make sure that those polygons are under the labels. And the way to do so is this is hacky. Unfortunately, there isn't an elegant solution, but it involves kind of layering base maps together. So you can see we've made two separate calls to add provider tiles. We've made use of this argument called add map pane and played around with the opacity of, of these. And then we can see that we now have the names of cities and the names of, um, we don't have this the state names, but we have city names, I think due to the base map I've used, but we can see them now overlaying our polygons, which is our desired um, outcome. Now, I don't know, this is new when I've knitted the document, but I can see here that my median incomes are tucked under my legend. So I'll have to do some revision of my code, apologies. Um, sometimes like when you, when you see things locally versus knitted, uh, some things do shift. Um, I'll make sure to fix that for when I share this, this with you guys. Uh, but I think we can gain an appreciation for just all the customizability that exists with with leaflet and um, if this is your first time playing around with maps i really do encourage you to sort of um, like delete arguments see what that looks like and then bring them back in that was really helpful for me when i was trying to learn what each each thing does um, as opposed to really sitting down and reading the documentation which can be a bit dry and a bit tedious at times Okay, so that concludes our leaflet walkthrough. The fourth workflow is with R2D3 maps. So what is R2D3 maps? Um, it is a package developed by the Dream Rs team. They make amazing stuff, uh, especially relating to HTML widgets that you can use in your Shiny app. So um, definitely recommend checking them out if, if you don't know of them. They've made this package, which allows us to create D3 maps. D3 is a JavaScript library that is super popular for dynamic and interactive data visualizations of all types. So not just maps, you can make any sort of uh, interactive uh, plot with D3. And like Leaflet, it has many of the same advantages. Um, also same advantages as the other ones like map view and tmap. So with this workflow, you never have to leave r and Studio. They easily plug into our Markdown and Shiny. They play nice with SB and SF packages. Uh, but there's some disadvantage to R2 and D3 maps. Um, the first one being that zooming is not possible and layering is also not possible out of the box. So what that means is with the package itself, you cannot do so. However, you can supply JavaScript code to add those in. But that of course um, implies that you have to know a little bit about JavaScript coding to write that. Um, but you can also take the approach of just stack overflowing this <laughs> and just copy paste code in and see what works. Um, you know, got to do what you got to do sometimes. Um, so that may be a, a little disadvantage of R2D3 maps, but I think with, you know, with same arguments for map view and tmap, it, it can be an attractive 
um, alternative if um, you want something quick and something that looks um, good um, out of the box. So um, same, same, you know, same deal here as with other packages. We start with initializing the map with a call here to D3 underscore map. Uh, we feed it our spatial data set, and then we start piping things in in terms of what we want um, to add. So here we're going to add, um, we're going to specify that our variable that we want um, the chloropleth to be is with income, and we're going to say these are to be made in continuous breaks. We're going to add a tooltip. So when we hover, we have you know, uh, values pop up, we're gonna add a legend, and then we're gonna add labs in terms of a title or a caption uh, or whichever. So with this, we see that things are looking a little weird. Um, the US is very tiny, Alaska's huge, and this is a sort of um, a tease to how important projections and coordinate reference systems can be. Um, I almost went down like a very big rabbit hole into coordinate reference systems, um, but because I needed to get this COVID-19 app deployed uh, relatively quickly, um, I was like, I don't have time for this right now. Like, what can I do? Okay, so I went to Stack Overflow and try to just fast track my way into understanding uh, projections. Um, so I found that the one that I was really after is not this default Mercator uh, projection, but one that's called Albers uh, USA projection, um, which basically allows you to shift Alaska and shift the island so that they all fit in sort of the same um, pane. So by changing the projection to Albers, but also importing those shape files that have that projection, we can see that the map now looks closer to what we were after. And so you'll notice um, when you're working through this, this document that we have interactivity, but the tooltip isn't appearing. Um, so that is because of an ongoing bug with how our 2D3 maps deploys with our Markdown and Shiny. Um, that is, you know, uh, sometimes uh, the issues that can arise with, with open source tools. Um, so I highly recommend if, if you end up really interested in mapping to go and, and help out the Dream Rs team um, by resolving this bug. But in any case, um, R2D3 Maps is quite an attractive solution as well um, and has many advantages as the others, um, except the customizability is definitely something that you'll need to work harder on by um, having and supplying your own JavaScript code. So that concludes our four workflows. Are there any questions, comments, things you want me to zoom in on? Oh, I think I wanted to show, there's a line in here um, to see just how it performs in a shiny app and dashboard. So I can pull that up through app and just running that. And open in browser. So this is the shiny CSS loaders uh, package in action. Um, that loading thing can be um, really nice and helpful, especially when you have heavy maps that take a little bit of time in rendering that just you know, signals to the user that something is coming. Um, you'd be surprised when you don't have that. People will oftentimes think it's broken or exit out of the page, um, and, and that's definitely not, not the desired outcome. 
Um, but yeah, we can see here that our legend seems to have been fixed. You know, these are big values here, here so we probably need to work on the font, um, which Leaflet makes quite easy to edit that um, in the code. But yeah, the important thing that we wanted here is like, as you know, as you zoom in and out, um, the, the the rendering is is really rapid. Um, with the base map that we've used, it's it's kind of cool. As you zoom in, you get more more information displayed. So we can see here that it. Um, plays really nicely and shiny and renders relatively quickly. And with the benefit of shiny, of course, is you can really customize this um, to be a, a dashboard that you would feel proud of, you know, displaying to uh, both internally and external uh, stakeholders. So you, I think you said this earlier, but was the, the COVID-19 project that you um, developed, so was that for stakeholders or did you make this map publicly available? Yeah, that's a great question. We, um, we made it publicly available, um, which, which drove a lot of our considerations in terms of it being like really portable, like easy to load, um, easy to share, and um, attractive enough that you know when you look at this you're like hmm, okay this this looks like professionally made like someone you know spent spent time on it um, and so I think that's why that's why we really liked this this leaflet workflow is is because it it made it made that you know really seamless for us and we've ended up deploying this website as a as a shiny application um, and. Were there uh, things that you had to go back and change about the map after you deployed it? Like, did you have to change like resolution or anything like that when you sort of realized, oh, this when there's this many people logging in, it like takes too long yeah. to load or like were there, you know, specific uh, parameters that you found you had to finagle with yeah. more than you thought? Yeah, that's a great question. One of the things we've noticed when we've deployed this is we had a lot of traffic to to the to the website, and so um, there's now some some sophisticated stuff you can do in the back end to to help load that that high traffic. But our hacky way, because once again we didn't really have time to invest, and it can be quite difficult to understand and, and change those parameters in the back end. What we ended up doing is creating um different websites um whoops you can kind of see here it says like zero three this is like the third shiny website that we made and just when people like logged in and just typed the first like string here up to outbreak detection it would then take them into one of the five that we've made randomly um, so that's one thing we did to help with traffic. In terms of changing the, the actual map itself, um, what we've ended up doing is people were asking if they could just look at their state in isolation as opposed to looking at the entire United States. So we ended up um, adding a essentially a drop down or a filter which in which they can select, let's say just Maryland, and then everything would be blank except for um, Maryland. So they can you know, choose to focus on that because sometimes it's not, even though we have like state names, it's not, it's not immediately clear when Maryland ends and Delaware starts, let's say, if you're not really familiar with the states. So um, that's one thing that we added. And of course, because Shiny has those capabilities of adding drop downs and, and filters um, that made it quite quite an easy request to accommodate um, and uh, that's that's the shiny part just adding like a filter or a drop down then you need the leaflet to actually like cooperate and and integrate that so the awesome thing about leaflet is it has um, what's called leaflet proxy in which depending on the filters and the parameters selected by the user, it doesn't re-render the map from scratch. Every single time a person selects a different parameter, it will just like adjust 
in in real time which is awesome because if this map were really heavy imagine every single time someone changed a parameter it would have to re-render which may take like a minute or 30 seconds which is still a lot of time um, so leaflet proxy is awesome um, in using when you you do want some uh, filters and and so on on your map there's also a question from uh, Liston, which mm -hmm. is when you start a new project, so would you start just with leaflet over the other three if you just had to choose one? Yeah, I, I, I definitely would. Um, just because, you know, when you're when you're trying to be mindful of of the time that you have in terms of like learning a new framework, you, you want that framework to be to encompass as many like functionalities as you would want. And I think Leaflet does a great job in terms of like its customizability options, um, its options to have like plugins, external plugins that you can put in to add like pretty sophisticated and nifty things into your map. And it's such a mature uh, framework that there's a lot there in terms of if you run into a bug there's most likely a stack overflow bug about it uh, lots of tutorials and also for really advanced uses um, because it's a javascript library you can supply javascript code inside your leaflet r code um, so that's 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 fantastic you definitely don't have to be limited to just what's in the leaflet r package you can you can plug in um, different things into it. Yeah, the fourth, um, sorry, fifth workflow that we haven't really touched upon is through Mapbox. So Mapbox became recently popular. It's a lot like Leaflet, um, except Mapbox is now actively being worked on as opposed to Leaflet. There's uh, people, it's so, it's so mature that there's there's no developers really working on it full time or even part time, except for a resolution of bugs and, and fixes like that. But Mapbox is being actively developed. However, even though there is an R package for it, it does involve you having to exit R and R Studio to go into the Mapbox.com platform and to add things in there. It's also not free up to a certain point, so they give you like a shape file size limit. After that, you have to pay. So that's that one I haven't really introduced um, because I did want to make this presentation like a like an R workflow based one. But that could be an option you could look into um, as well. I know the New York Times have used them for their COVID nineteen maps, and they're they're really stunning. Um, so yeah. I have another question. Sure. Um, have you played around with merging any sort of more like non-traditional layers on top of like these shape files, if that makes sense? So like, you know, it makes sense that income is very, uh, the, the data set is already, it's easy to merge. It's kind of like out of the box, um, simpler to work with. So I guess if you wanted to work with, um, with a map layer that was a little bit more like less less utilized how do you think of that as like a gigantic project or um is that are these relatively easy to to manipulate um yeah that's a that's a great question um i think i've if i if i understand it correctly it's like we have these incomes really neatly stratified by counties. So our join even was like really simple to perform. We just did it on FIPS code, which is county identifiers. But let's say, let's say for your COVID-19 project, and this is an issue I ran into. So the COVID-19 data from um, Johns Hopkins U University, actually, um, they, they were the ones supplying our COVID-19 data. Uh, they had it for the entire um, New York City area. However, New York City comprises multiple counties. Um, so then we're like, okay, well, we can't 
neatly join this because um, Johns Hopkins thinks New York City is all these four counties, but then I have four counties as part of my shape file. So what am I going to do? So we ended up, that's kind of the fourth step in the workflow is using the SF package to additionally manipulate your shape files. And so lo and behold, there's a command in um, the SF package to combine shapes. So what we ended up doing is literally just say, okay, all these counties, just treat them as one. Okay, so then just take the outside like borders of each one of those. Um, so that that was easy once you find the command you wanna use. But it, like I started to get into my head about like, how am I gonna do this? Is it like manual? Like just, just sometimes, yeah, like, yeah, just half the battle is just like knowing that there's a solution out there for you in R and then you find it and you're like, what? It's one line and it ended up being one line. So so these things, all this to say that it, it can get quite complicated, you know, manipulating these spatial objects. It's not always easy. Um, you know, I think we're this is we're pretty privileged, I think, to have this ecosystem of packages that have these shape files even for other parts of the world that may be a challenge. Um, I, I certainly, you know, saw that a little bit with um, when I gave this talk about Kenya. So I mean, we're very grateful for the work Shell has done to um, clean Kenyan shape files and make them readily available via an R package, but that's not always possible. Um, for other for other countries, so sometimes um, the analyst may have to just import these from a governmental source, and it's messy and it's riddled with errors, and you have to do a lot of cleaning and and manipulations. But thankfully, hopefully, uh, with the arsenal of tools we have through R, especially with the SF package, um, um, it can help. It can help with that with that cleaning, and that processing. Um, but yeah, sometimes these workflows can get can get pretty, pretty, pretty complicated. One thing I had to do recently for work. Oh, my gosh, I have one percent. One second I'm to charge. <laughs> uh, hopefully I don't die in these 30 seconds. OK, we're back on. Um, one thing I had to do recently is to not only have an interactive chloropleth like this of of a variable, but also add in markers um, relating to people's addresses. And, you know, that that was, you know, quite, quite difficult, just wrangling addresses. Um, but we have we have packages now, free packages to help with that. There's tidy geocoder, uh, which is which is really nice. And with that, you know, you get um, just geographical resolution um, that's not necessarily in your address. You know, for example, county names will come um, when you run it through tidy geo geocoder and stuff like that. So um, yeah, can get pretty involved. But once your data is clean and manipulated and like ready to go, then the visualization is, is the easy part, I think. Um, if we wanted to add like markers, let's say if people's addresses, then it's like one line, just like pipe in add markers and then the, the column name. That's so awesome. Yeah, these are really beautiful. Does anyone uh, have any other questions for Asma? Great, great. Well, thank you all so much um, for being with us today. Um, Margaret, I, I noticed you popped on. Did you want to say anything before we close out? No, thanks so much for hosting, Asma. That was an awesome um, presentation. Yes. Um, I'm really excited for the lineup of speakers we have coming up um, for this year. And it's a great way to kick things off, for sure. So it's nice to see some familiar faces. Um, I know we've been off for a little while. Um, but yeah, I think we're getting geared up for some awesome speakers this year. Um, again, so it's just nice to see people. And be yeah, yeah, hopefully we see you all at our future meetup events. Um, yeah, and thank you so much again. I'm gonna go uh, make a map right now. I don't know <laughs> of what yet, but I'm inspired.
That's awesome. Oh, um, one thing I didn't mention is I, I wanted I wanted to really demonstrate like a common workflow of like importing shape files, joining it to external data sets, and then visualization. But specifically with Kyle Walker's tidy census package, there's an argument you can feed in there of just obtaining the geometries along with the census data you're interested in. So you don't even have to bother with the first step. So if you want to go nuts on that, um, you can and that's a easier easier way to just like make a quick map if you're interested in doing that oh and um you're the r markdown file that you shared with us today yes. um Absolutely. i will send that to me and then we will post that where margaret we can post it on our meetup page um on our github and on our slack channel as well um yep so awesome. I'll, I'll send that over and then I'll also let you know of the GitHub link if someone wants to just import the whole repo. Perfect. Okay, great. All right. Thank, Thank you. you so bye guys. All right. Bye. Thanks everybody for coming.